And Conference just, is being recorded. There we go. You should have heard our lady recording you. And facilitating the webinar with me will be Anna Yeager, who is also from TechSoup, the co-director of our Green Tech Initiative. We'll be featuring two presenters, Hayes Morehouse from the Ella Baker Center and Matthew Bauer from Better World Telecom. And I will go ahead and let them start chatting. Um, for those of you who have raised your hands, you are welcome to put those hands down at this point. If you do have a question throughout the webinar that you don't need to chat through, you can raise your hand and one of the people monitoring the chat can follow up with you directly. So I'm going to pass it over to Anna Yeager to get started. Hello and welcome to the Telegram Your Work webinar. My name is Anna Yeager and as Becky said, I'm the co-director of TechSoup Global's Green Tech Initiative. Through Green Tech, we educate nonprofits and libraries about how to use technology to reduce environmental impact, like reducing your travel, and how to reduce the environmental impact of technology, for example, using power management on your computers. Uh, sorry, I'm just getting the hang of, uh, of this tool as well. Uh, this month we are hosting a uh, travel reduction campaign. It's an educational campaign to help nonprofits and libraries and other social benefit organizations discover ways to save money, reduce travel, and be more effective in your work. We have four weekly topics, virtual meetings, online training, telecommuting, and online collaboration. If you want to read more about them uh, or follow uh, forum threads or ask questions, please go to www.techsoup.org slash green tech slash travel. And again, we'll send that link out to you afterwards in a follow-up email. Because we all learn differently, we strive to provide the information in a variety of ways. And we also attempt to identify tools that are either free for nonprofits or offer a nonprofit discount. So we present the information uh, through articles and blog posts, discussion forums, and, uh, and product analysis as, as well as pointing you directly to those tools. So uh, I encourage you to check out our website for more information. Uh, no. We are joined today uh, by uh, Matthew Bauer, an expert in modern telecommunications, and Hayes Morehouse who works at a nonprofit who has implemented some of these technologies. So you'll get to hear uh, his case study, his take on how uh, they have implemented these technologies. Matt Bauer is a social entrepreneur who has worked to improve communities in the U.S. and abroad for both the for-profit and nonprofit sectors over the past 20 years. And before co-founding Better World Telecom, Matt served in a series of leadership roles in the telecommunications and power industries, including the AES Corporation, Nettel Communications, and ValueCom. He has helped to start or significantly grow a number of nonprofits over the past 10 years. And Hayes Morehouse has been the Director of Technology at the Ella Baker Center since 2005. He has transformed the agency's use of technology, making the organization more cohesive and efficient. Before that, he was an IT consultant for nonprofits around the San Francisco Bay Area, working to improve their IT infrastructure as well as helping them to collect, maintain, and use records of their services and impact. At this time, we'd like to get some uh, information from you. Let me get to the right slide. How many of you have staff or volunteers who work remotely at least one day a week? Please raise your hand. Wow, that's a very that we're seeing a lot of people raising their hands. I'd say, what about 50 people there, Becky? Yeah, that's great. And then, uh, which technologies? Oh, sorry. Um, which technologies do you already use in your in your uh, office? Please chat in your answers. Are you using POTS system, plain old telephone system? Voice over IP, virtual PBX, or VPN. Go ahead and chat in. Okay, so we're seeing POTS, VPN, phone, VoIP, cell phones, VPN, old PBX. Oh, I see some Skype users and go to use, go to meeting users. 
Great. Uh, remote desktop. Yeah, mobile phones came up a lot in there as well. Blackberries, Google Docs. Great. Go to my PC, Trios. Great. Thank you for the feedback. That's helpful for us to know what people are already using. Lots of BlackBerry users out there. It's great to see you using those mobile technologies. VoIP and old telephone. Okay. Now I'd like to uh, inter turn it over to Matt Bauer of uh, Better World Telecom. Matt, are you, uh, are you great. there? Great. Thank, thank, yep, sure. Thank you, Anna. And uh, thank you all for uh, uh, my coming through. Okay, Anna? Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you all for uh, for for being on this this call and webinar. And uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, it was great that we could see some of the responses there uh, in terms of some of the technologies you're using, and and in terms of what level of remote work. It seems like this group has had an adoption, at least of the more open work concepts, and uh, not everybody driving to four walls every day. Uh, and and a, a whole myriad of, of technologies too, but I saw a lot of uh, plain old telephone systems in there and uh, opportunities to potentially start moving towards more exciting technologies. So what I'd like to do over the next 10 minutes or so is really paint uh, a high-level picture of the opportunity here in terms of the concepts that, that we're uh, uh, talking about in terms of we use the terms open work or telegreening and. Uh, we we talk talk about it in our company as better work as well. So I'll sort of use those interchangeably, and then provide some ground level examples uh, and tools that can be used to accomplish moving organizations from where they might be or where they are today to uh, to a more open work environment and with more flexibility to do these things, and just more or less generate the what ifs. You know, this is uh, we're not going to be able to show you every every detail and every way of doing this. And that's what all these great follow-ups are for. Uh, so it's at least get the get the juice, creative juices flowing here. And uh, moving on to uh, some of the industry uh, folks here in the telecom industry, you'll see a term here that I use: ICT, which is information commu <clears throat> information and communications technology as a sector, and that is really anything that touches the network. So whether it's your PC or phones or data centers or printers or routers, that's sort of the, the catch-all. So there are a number of parties now both inside our industry and outside, as you'll see on the World Wildlife Fund report here that just came out, that are estimating the, the carbon savings to be substantial um, in terms of uh, uh, implementing much more proactively uh, ICT technology solutions, telegreening solutions, and uh, I'll get to some of those exact, exact numbers there. But the World Wildlife Fund reports uh, up to a 50% reduction in the U.S. carbon emissions in the next few decades just from an, a ramp up in adoption. It's not like we all, you know, the, the point of this is not to say everybody go work from home, never travel, and don't go see anybody again, and we can't have human contact. I mean, nobody's saying that. This is more of just a incremental change, and the incremental change has a serious uh, impact on the, the, the physical uh, CO2 emissions that we have. So uh, we'll provide some links to some of these reports if you want to dive in more uh, in the, in the follow-up as well. So a simple statement that we can start from, and I think it's a great place to sort of get ourselves at, which is if we move around too much and there are too many buildings, this is kind of the root cause of, uh, of what's uh, creating most of the CO2, at least here in the U.S. So um, if we remove the intermediate components you know, that folks are talking about, hybrids, hybrids uh, offsets, solar, wind, and so on, it still remains that transportation and buildings are, are really the core problem. And this uh, demonstrates what, what I mean in that buildings and transportation contribute about 75% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. today. And our industry, or the, the sector that has the opportunity to really influence this, is about 2.5% of the global footprint. So most of the companies that are in that space are really focused in on that 2.5% and lowering their costs, whereas the opportunity there is to affect the other 97.5%. And, and again, you, you'll have this, this presentation, and I'm kind of 
the high level stuff here I'm kind of blowing by, but this is more or less just to get your you know, framework in mind that uh, about half of that uh, footprint in the ICT world that is, uh, uh, is just pr printers and computers. So uh, data centers and all the other telephony infrastructure and all that makes up about the other half. So with that frame in mind, we start driving more into the, how the organization works and what, this, what these technologies enable. So <clears throat> if we look at, at substitution, uh, and starting to, to replace some of our activity with technology. And again, I, I stress some of our activity with technology. These two factors in, in terms of our time wasted sitting in traffic, the cost of the economy, and back to this World Wildlife Fund report, which in one of their scenarios, if we just ramped up telecommuting and virtual meetings and did, did some travel replacement, that they've, they've uh, concluded that we could reduce our total greenhouse gas emissions as a country by about 50% in the next uh, two to three decades. So these are uh, uh, very significant numbers and opportunities that we can uh, take back to the organization. So these are, that's sort of a high level component. And now let's start drilling into what we can do today, how we can affect our individual organizations, and that's the important piece in that the benefits of this are really twofold. It's both the greenhouse gas reduction and the cost and the flexibility that it brings to the organization. So some of the tools we can use for this are web audio video conferencing. We're doing web and audio right here on, the, uh, on, on our webinar. Video conferencing is becoming much more cost effective and works really well for certain organizations. Unified communications voice over internet as an enabler, uh, kind of an underlying technology of this, virtual PBX and mobility and wireline, enabling things like telecommuting, mobile workforce, having uh, more flexible office capabilities, and also removing some of the equipment and wiring and heating and cooling requirements that we have at the location. So let's define a few of these uh, components, unified communications, is really bringing the idea of bringing together phone, fax, voice, internet, email, I'm sorry, uh, uh, voicemail, and some email components, centralizing that communications. It's really agnostic to what technology is being used uh, uh, and, and, and communicates with any device, whether it's a PDA or a, a cell phone, a landline, a uh, voice over internet phone. And you know, think about kind of pulling the, the infrastructure and the phone numbers of the organization up into the cloud. And that when you do that, it, it creates a lot of flexibility for the organization, both how you work and lowers costs in other ways operationally. Voice over internet, a lot of people are, uh, 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 use VoIP as a, as a term. And you ask 100 people, and they'll have 100 different answers. It's really just a, a transmission protocol. It, it's it's uh, the, the method by which a lot of this happens. It's taking your voice and making it into ones, ones and zeros and transmitting it and decoding it. So that's really what VoIP is at the core. And then virtual PBX, it's taking that, that private branch exchange that's in most folks' offices and so on in your telephone closet or computer room and pulling that up into the cloud and giving you all those voicemail, call handling, phone tree features. Um, <clears throat> so this, this type of planning, you know, really l lends itself to looking at how the organization works and taking a holistic uh, viewpoint of how we can change how we work to be more efficient, to save costs, and to save uh, on our greenhouse gas emissions too. It's very important that we have, you know, quality costs and accountability because the, you, the users and the organization and employees need to have a quality solution too. So focusing on, on this as, as a holistic solution with uh, the different types of options that are out there, increasing productivity, how do we affect other parts of the organization, not just our IT and telecom costs, but really making the whole organization uh, more cost effective. And these are some uh, examples of that increasing the uh, results-oriented work environment, lowering uh, OPEX and CAPEX, 
and uh, have, you know more satisfied employees uh, because of results. So one thing we've done is we've gone out and uh, uh, Better World and we commissioned a study with the Bainbridge Graduate Institute that's now almost complete, taking a street level view of this and saying, hey, what are some organizations that have done this with success? Let's model some uh, uh, organizations as well and see what the results are uh, for a small, medium, and large incorporating some of these technologies. And uh, that will be, uh, that report will be uh, available via uh, TechSoup here real soon. We, we, this is an output of the model. It's not very easy to read, but I just wanted to sort of show what the different categories are. We took a 25-person organization and, and modeled uh, the different savings. And uh, by, by just a slight uptick of, of, of using open work concepts, uh, five of the 25 starting to go remote, you save 31,000 pounds of CO2, and the benefits are $57,000 to the organization <clears throat> per year from just some slight adjustments and some travel uh, replacement with technology as well. Sun Micro did this, another example that we use in the, in the study. Uh, half their workforce works two to three days per week. They saved almost 70 million in costs, reduced their real estate. Because that's the whole thing is that increasing productivity, reducing the amount of physical space we need because not everybody's there all the time. And then what happens then is you reduce your CO2 uh, output as you can see from, from the slide there and they did it almost 24,000 tons. So in conclusion, uh, this is really a technical uh, social issue as much as it is a technical issue, getting folks to think a little bit differently about what is work and how we work. The, the, not, uh, the, the collateral effects of this really are you spend more time in communities and, and uh, you know, we can uh, be more support supportive of concepts like local living economies that Bali uh, is promoting. Also, another organization, uh, World Blue, promoting more democratic and transparent uh, workplaces. So, so this really does boil down into a, a, a great uh, concept for organizations to improve in many different ways. And the conclusion, better uh, open work is better for people, the planet, and directly has an impact on operational expenses for the nonprofit. That is it. Thank you. Thank you very much for... Thank you, Matt. Uh, so mm -hmm. we had uh, one question that, uh, from the audience that I'd like to ask you right now. What, could sure. you please define for us OPEX and COPEX? They were in your oh, uh, operational, I'm sorry, operational expenses and capital expenditures. So operational, just uh, more or less the, uh, day -to -day, the costs of, of, of running the organization um, day to day, and then capital expenditures, you know, purchasing equipment, um, and, and different items to you know, run the infrastructure. So uh, on an operational side, things like rent and uh, 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 you know, other, other office expenses from, from month to month can, can get lowered from, from more open work concepts as well as uh, the equipment, if you're going virtual PBX or do more conferencing or things like that, you you need less equipment in the uh, in the premise at the at the same time. Great. And another uh, question from the audience: uh, Did your study include the cost of the systems and time to set them up to enable the working from home? So that I think it's that fifty-seven thousand dollars that you uh, were talking to on on one of your earlier slides. Well, the, the, I mean, in terms of the, the virtual PBX uh, uh, systems that we were modeling, the setup costs are, are, are minimal. Um, and, and yes, we took all that into account. The, the study will be much more detailed in showing all of our assumptions and results, and, uh, and, it, and it will show that. Most of those cost savings come, don't come from, and this is what we're trying to get folks to think about, the, 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 the massive changes here are not within the, oh, you know, right now I'm paying $5 for telecom and it's going to go down to $4. It's my building expense goes down, my heating, my cooling, my productivity goes up, other, you know, workforce elements. And these have all been shown, you know, in a large scale with a lot of these organizations that have done this. Uh, the impacts on the rest of the organization are much more significant than any costs related to the system itself. Excellent. 
So we'll field some more questions from the audience uh, in a little bit, but I have a couple questions of my own here for you, Matt. So could you describe a couple of telecom problems or concerns that you find that small to medium-sized organizations typically have? Uh, well, I'll, I'll focus on uh, at least the small, the small mid, uh, you know, depending on the, the definition of medium, I'll, I'll say that that's probably actually a little bit larger organization. Uh, small organizations uh, typically don't have someone on staff to really uh, to tend to this day to day and can be really burdened by traditional uh, phone systems that have uh, have a heavy burden of when something goes wrong, then you have to depend on other third, third parties to come in and fix them. Uh, a lot of the new uh, solutions allow you to make moves, adds, changes, deletes, and things ongoing. Um, so I think from a resource uh, perspective, the, uh, a, lot of, a lot of folks are still using traditional systems and they are cumbersome and very limited in terms of what they allow the organization to do. And uh, the second part of that is that it then makes it difficult to really use uh, telecom and IT in a, in a, in a proactive way to, to make the, the organization more efficient too. So, but the problem, you know, is a lot of people uh, when they raise their hand or they chatted about what they have, I mean, our estimates, and I don't have an exact number on this, but talking to some industry experts, most folks are still using, you know, at least 80 to 90 percent are still using what I would deem more traditional solutions, uh, you know, POTS lines and, and DSL and traditional phone systems that are more expensive to run on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, a couple of people asked in the chat tool whether increasing telecommuting just transfers the carbon production and use to the individual. Um, and I know I think Jim Lynch is also monitoring our chat and may have responded a little bit, but it would be great if you could talk about kind of what the difference is um, between having people in the office and transferring to the individual as somebody implied in one of the chat questions and whether that's true or, or not true or how, how that kind of impact changes. Well, the, all the studies that I mentioned earlier, and there are probably a dozen out now in the, last, in the last year or so, if we're talking about the United States and the dynamics here uh, and how much people drive and commute, just imagine removing a slice. You know, we could put up all the wind farms and solar fields and, uh, sorry, solar farms and wind, either way, uh, and, and drive hybrids and so on, and that's great, and it does help incrementally shift that. But if we physically take a percentage of that driving out of uh, the, the carbon production, that is, that is a the impacts of that are, are huge versus offsetting them some other way. Uh, and the uh, building space reduction, I mean the numbers that I quoted in the Sun, uh, Sun Micro uh, take into account all detailed reports that they did. And when you look at the average home, or wherever they would be working from, uh, that that uh, is all these all these reports are are taking these these things into account. Um, it is not you know by by being able to physically reduce the building space that we you're, you're like your home your home's already there and in terms of heating and cooling most homes do not have smart heating and cooling. Uh, and are being heating and cooled throughout the day. Uh, the person sitting there, you know, in a home office working a couple days a week, is not uh, increasing, you know, the burden on the home that much. It's the physical building space that we're replicating uh, by having all this office space all around the country. That if we can start staving that off, it, it'll have a huge impact. Thank you, Matt. We'll be able to field a few more questions from the audience a little bit later. But right now I'd like to uh, move on and introduce Hayes. Um, and uh, Hayes is from the Ella Baker Center. And I'll let him introduce himself. And uh, why don't you tell us about why you made the decision to switch to new telecom technologies. Okay. Hi, my name is Hayes Morehouse. I'm the Technology Director at the Ella Baker Center. The Ella Baker Center is a strategy and action center working for justice, opportunity, and peace in urban America. We're in Oakland, and we're an organization of about um, 25 people. 
and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our experience in the last year of switching to a new phone system. So we actually had an interesting experience um, of what not to do. So I hope people can learn from our mistakes a little bit. Um, we our uh, voicemail system just stopped working um, in the sort of the middle of last year, and uh, we had a we had to figure out rather quickly what to do. Um, so uh, <laughs> we, we kind of looked at our options and, and uh, figured that we could either repair our old phone system, we could upgrade to an in-house voice over IP system, so replace what we already had with voice over IP and kind of have it work mostly the same, or we could go with a hosted voice over IP, um, which is some of what Matt was talking about earlier. Um, so we, we thought about this, and you know, repairing our old phone system meant about $5,000 to fix it now, and then about $10,000 more um, in a couple of years when, we were, when, when the rest of the system was basically scheduled to break. I mean, our phone system was about 10 years old when, when we started, and the, uh, that's about the lifespan. We got pretty good use out of our, out of our um, voicemail system. And the switching system, the guys were telling me it would last about 13 years, maybe if we were lucky. So you know, we looked at this and we're like, mm, we should just move on to something new. So then we thought about you know, bringing it, you know, having something in-house um, that would run the voice over IP. Would that save us money? Um, and the problem with that is um, that I would then be responsible for maintaining it and you know, keeping it up, or we'd have to have somebody that would come in and do it. And mostly that just takes up staff time. You know, as, as a relatively small organization, um, the way anything that we can push out to other people that, that allows us to focus on our mission more, um, we're interested in doing that. So then we looked at the hosted voice over IP system and eventually decided that that's what we wanted to do. So, um, so the, you know, this, this, it works. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think some people out there have a, have a pretty good idea how it works, but for those that don't, um, I'll just give you a little rundown about what we've learned about the hosted voice over IP. Um, it, it doesn't actually directly cost us a lot less than our old, um, we call them POTS, but basically we had 10 AT&T phone lines coming into the building and a system that switched between all of them. Um, and, it, you know, and that was costing us a couple thousand dollars a month. To run all that, you know, with the with the uh, um, long distance and all that stuff. So now we have, um, you know, a, a voice over IP system where we have each individual phone that has much greater functionality than what we had before for about the same cost. Um, so basically, we switched to something that had very limited capabilities, was all in house to something that gave us really great functionality. Um, and the interesting thing, I don't know if we were really clear about this before, but what's really cool about in terms of voice over IP and especially the host of voice over IP is that the phones themselves are the system. All you have to do to make the phone work and connect as if you're in the office you know, with your extension, with your voicemail, with all that stuff, is plug it into an Internet and turn the phone on. And the phone connects to the servers and does its magic, and then, um, and then it just gets the phone number automatically. So we could put somebody at, you know, in New York City, and, I and people will call them on their Oakland 510 area code and have no idea that they're over there. And people, you know, our receptionist could transfer to them as if they were in the building entirely seamlessly. So it, get, it can give like, a really professional feel to, for people who are working at home. So there's nothing that's you know, calling around. There's none of this kind of disconnected feel to it at all. It's, it's very integrated. So we're happy that we kind of have these new phones that provide us. You know, before we didn't have any kind of functionality at all. We had, um, we didn't even have a, a caller ID. So we're excited that you know we have all this you know fancy features and stuff. So our telecommuting package. I mean, I don't actually have uh, users that are off-site all the time. I have people that work at home one or two days a week. Um, Mostly, you know, we have we do have one person that lives in Sacramento, and it's about an hour and a half drive for him to get to work. So, um, we have him work at home sometimes. And so, what we do is we have a, a sort of a combination of technologies that we use. Um, the first is the phones that I've gone over, and then we do have a VPN, which is a simple um, VPN that just came with the router that we have. You know, we selected a router that that came with with you know a minimal VPN, 
and I'm, you know, very careful about, you know, you can only connect to this from the computer that we give you and make sure that people, um, in terms of security, that we don't have other people, you know, sort of logging into that VPN. And the other thing that we have to make things more integrated is we actually use um, Google's hosted uh, Gmail functions for our in-house. So again, that's all is just basically internal. The browser serves as your main web client. So you can be working in the office, you can be working at home. And then of course Google has Google Docs, so that allows for a lot of the collaboration so you don't have to go to the VPN to get to the server. So that's how that works. Um, Hayes, um, we mm -hmm. actually had a, a question. I uh, wanted to ask you to reiterate one point. People have sure. been asking, did you say you can take your phone home, plug it into the Internet, and it connects you to the office? That's ex it, it connects you as if you were sitting in the office. You can take the phone to a hotel theoretically and plug it in, and if your hotel will get you online in a normal way, then you can connect exactly as if you were at the office. And uh, so. also there seems to be a little confusion too about what is VPN. Can you, can you tell oh, us a little bit about what you mean fault. and how uh, that's v a – go ahead. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and it's a way to connect to your office from uh, externally. So, so you know, most of the resources that people have are, are here in the office. So you know, the, the shared files, the printers, and stuff like that are on site. And so if somebody you know, is working from home and they want to share a file with somebody that's either working at another home or working in the office, they can connect through the VPN to the office and get that information. And I think what people most – I mean, we're, you know, we are – trying to figure out ways around using this traditional VPN um, because I think they are pretty – they're security concerns. Um, and so you know, that's why we're trying to – we're shifting to using Google Docs for some of the, the you know, shared document creation and, and you know, working collaboratively. Great. To jump back to the phone, a number of people have been chatting in questions about how big is this phone or can you use a regular – Landline, or do you need a special phone? Is it the size of a cell phone, or is it some desk size phone? So, if you want to share a little bit more detail about what your specific phone system is like, and um, and there's another question here about internet connection and how much speed you need to actually support something like that. Okay. So the phones that we use um, are look basically like regular your regular office desk phone. Um, and then there might be travel versions that you could take with you. Um, there are other, the other cool thing about the, the, the hosted voice over IP is that you can have it transfer calls to your cell phone. So there's all kinds of fancy stuff that you can start doing with it once you, once you get the system installed. Um, but our phones, and the phone basically just plugs into, it, it cannot work on a regular um, telephone line. It has to be connected to an Internet connection. And the Internet needs to be – your basic broadband will work. Um, I mean, in our office what we did was install a separate T1 line just for the phones. So in that, you know, we have 20 people here, but we don't really need 20 people talking at once. So that'll hold, that will allow about 10 to 12 people simultaneously making phone calls without degraded call quality. Great. Now a couple of people asked about Skype and whether or not this is – you know, what you're talking about, is that the same as Skype or is that different from Skype? And um, another person also asked about what, what VoIP service you actually use, what company is your provider. So if you could kind of address both of those, that would be great. Sure. Um, it's different from Skype. Skype uh, uses the computer itself uh, to – um, make a connection. And you can also do the same thing now through Google Chat actually. Um, so Google has a video chat, which is another – actually incidentally is another way that we sort of integrate the workplace. It's like you can, you can either call people up or you can um, just chat with them. Sometimes it's quicker. So um, what was the other question? I'm sorry. The other question was just what service you use for your VoIP. Oh, um, so we actually use um, Better World Telecom. Um, we did a lot of um, consideration. We also looked at um, several other companies before we decided to go with them. They, um, but what it ended up being is, is we wanted to go with a company we felt was going to provide great service. Um, and so Better World, you know, came out and talked to us. And you know, there, there's, 
you know, people that you can call or cell phone, <laughs> and they'll get right back to you if you have a problem. And we didn't feel like we were going to get that from another company. So great. Well, thank you for that. And you know, a couple of people mentioned Skype on the chat, and you know, thought it was worth mentioning that Skype also has phones that you can use with that service too. And we do have a number of resources. Um, on TechSoup's website, both in the Green Tech section and on our blog and some articles that do compare some unified communications options and talk about things like using Google Voice and Video Chat or Skype or Wimba or webinar tools. So there are a lot of resources available out there beyond what we're covering in this call as well. I think we have a few other questions that people submitted. Unless Anna, if you had something you wanted to interject with as well. Yeah, actually uh, before we move on to all the audience questions, uh, what were some of the challenges that you experienced while implementing your new system? Um, so it did take us a while to settle on a provider um, you know, because we had to go through the process of getting bids and talking to different people, and so that, that took a while. Um, you know, even after we decided what kind of system we wanted to use, then we had to have the other problem of deciding you know, which provider to use. And it, you know, my, my experience was it, you know, it pays to kind of go back and forth and get some different bids and talk to different salespeople and um, you know, to definitely make sure you know what you're getting into. Almost all providers require a contract, so I think ours were three years. So um, do be careful <laughs> um, you know, whether, you know, making sure you understand everything that you're signing when you get into the contract. And then getting the phones themselves installed um, was a project. Um, you know, because you, you want to have it be pretty seamless. You want to get all the phones installed and then make the switch over to a new phone system. And you know, we, we were lucky to have some people helping us that made it pretty easy. You know, but it's, it's a whole new system and so things were a little bit complicated, and, but it worked out. And then the other thing was getting rid of the old phones um, took a little bit of doing. We had to, you know, because what do you do with them? So um, we didn't want to just throw them away. So I ended up finding somebody on Craigslist who paid $150 for 30 phones. She probably sold for a hundred dollars each. So, but there might be more creative ways of doing that. But it's still like, what are you going to do with them? So, yeah, I'd just like to jump in there for uh, getting rid of old phones. There are mm -hmm. a number of different ways to do it. Reselling them, uh, reuse mm -hmm. is the highest form of recycling. So, if there's mm -hmm. somebody out there who could benefit from your old phones, uh, that's fantastic. There might also be uh, refurbishers out there who could take mm -hmm. some of these. Uh, older phone systems and, and rework them and get them out to organizations that might need them. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, uh, please work with a responsible recycler to make sure that your old electronics uh, don't just get dumped in the landfill. And you can find uh, some uh, recyclers uh, and refurbishers on uh, the TechSoup website. Uh, we mm -hmm. have a list of, of a variety of providers around the, around the U.S. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we decided that we didn't want to try to sell them one by one, so I just found somebody who was reselling all of them. So we did some of that stuff. That's great. We had um, a few folks asked about what the what you approximated the cost to be of implementing and maintaining your VoIP at your organization. Do you have a, a an estimate or solid numbers on kind of what the overall cost was for you? Um. We we didn't run the numbers on what it would cost to. It, are we meaning if we wanted to host it ourselves, or or the cost? And the nice the nice thing about having it hosted by somebody else is that it makes the cost really easy. We just pay um, the I think it's a couple thousand a month, but for our whole phone system and our internet and everything, um, and then that's it. So it's not. It's not a huge, okay. you know, it's sort of an easy cost. We didn't run the numbers on what it would cost to have somebody, you know, have the in-house phone system, and then it, we didn't do all that stuff. So we just kind of we we looked we looked at our systems and decided we didn't actually have the staff time at all to deal with that, and so we just didn't do it. Okay. I mean, I think one person clarified a little bit and said, "What about the startup cost for the equipment, or baseline cost versus after the transition costs?" So you say monthly it costs about a couple thousand dollars mm -hmm. to keep it running. So I guess startup costs would be the other part of that. Um, you know, does it cost extra for all of the phones and transitioning all of that? I think to get an idea, especially for smaller nonprofits who are looking at whether or not it's it's um, financially feasible to take the plunge. I mean, the the nice thing is that it's not 
like the phones themselves were a couple hundred dollars each. Um, but that's about the same as you're going to pay for a regular digital PBX phone. Like our phones used to cost $150 each. And then, but then there's no other equipment or very little other equipment that you need to buy. So when we installed it, we just installed a new T1 line just for the phone. And I hope, I mean, a T1 line, for folks that don't know, is um, a type of Internet connection that's very reliable and has good um, speeds both up and down. So both those things are what you want for your phone system. Um, and and then that's it. That's all. We, that's all the equipment that we chose to install. There are other systems that you can install if you if you want to get, um, you know, if you have more users and you want to make sure that the that the voice that the phone system is working, um, or that the traffic is routed properly. That there are other equipment that you can buy. But that's all we decided to buy. Okay, so great. It ended up costing us about five thousand dollars. There were a couple of other people who just wanted to know what um, operating systems you're using. Are you using Windows, Mac, Linux? And have you found any complications if you have people running multiple platforms um, in syncing these things up, whether it's your VPN or your VoIP or any of the technologies we're talking about that you've implemented? Uh, we run almost all Mac. Um, and in terms of the VPN, that the, there's a built-in client with the Mac that we use, um, the same as the built-in client for Windows. Um, and the phone systems don't you know, really interact directly with the, with the um, operating system. The nice thing is you know, in terms of some of the other stuff, like with, with the Google stuff, obviously it's, it's cross-platform. It's all run through the browser. Um, so it does help us integrate a lot actually. So. Excellent. And uh, a question for both of you, either who, either one of you who has uh, some good tips on this. How would an NPO or a library implement some of these technologies? Is there are, are there some good first steps? Um, well, if, if Hayes, if you, I'll, I'll Go ahead. start it out real quick. Um, it's really, I mean, the thing about this is that it doesn't really discriminate on the type of organization from that perspective. It's really the, the factors that affect what decisions you make are more related to what, uh, how the organization works really and uh, you know, how, how many people are there, are they there all the time, you know, and then you sort of back, back out from that. Um, the, the voice channels have a certain amount of capacity that they take when you're on the phone uh, inside the T1 or, or larger pipe or smaller. I mean, you can do this over a DSL if it's a small organization as well, but you, you, uh, you're integrating things into uh, one platform as opposed to having two separate networks, a phone network and an Internet. So it, it's more efficient and typically saves, uh, can save uh, money just on that, on that front. Um, but it's not it's not always the case. So, in terms of the planning, you you do an audit of of the organization and say, what are you doing today? How do you uh, what do you want to do one year, two years, three years out? What are your constraints? What are your challenges? And then you uh, take the appropriate products um, and create a solution. Which uh, you know all the all the technologies out there today. It's finding a uh, an organization or Group of organizations that can give it to you in a quality fashion that you can uh, that you can live with, and, and at a price that's attractive as well. So, um, starting with an audit of the organization and the current communications needs and requirements are are essential. So, Matt, can you just clarify who would do those audits? Would do they talk to their telecom provider or their independent consultants who does that? Where do they find somebody who can help? Uh, I, I, I see organizations that do both. You know, you can go to your existing provider if if they have all the the tools that uh, that you need, um, and consultants can can help as well. I think this is uh, you know there's enough information out there that if you treat it as a project and and do a thorough job like Hayes did. Uh, that you can probably come to the conclusions on your own. I, I don't know that this is necessarily a, a job for that you need a consultant, but if it's complex, it does help. It definitely helps to get somebody go and root out all the solutions so that you can at least take a look at them and 
Um, so that can be cost effective and help save potentially uh, making some mistakes like Hayes had alluded to. Um, so both ways, both ways have value for sure. Uh, go ahead. I think from inside the organization, I mean, if I had to do it over again, I would um, start with the budgeting process. I don't know. I mean, at, at our organization and lots of organizations, you know, we kind of do a budget once a year, and then that's what we've got to work with for the year. And so, if I had it to do over again, I would start um, putting the money in the budget, like doing research on my own about how much this is going to cost, and then make the you know put the money in the budget and make the uh, the case for why it's important to spend this money now. Um, I mean, the piece of information I didn't know was how old our old phone system was, and you know what the expected lifespan of that. I think if I had known that information, I mean, I was I was already thinking that we would, we should get a new phone system. I just didn't realize that. Um, it was as imminent as we as we you know we should have been more proactive on it. So I mean in terms of you know like a lot of I mean it's, it's the same as any technology purchase you know you you figure out what your costs are, and then you uh, and you make the case to management to to ask for the money. So. And and I think to add to that in terms of looking at budgets the the interesting opportunity that does exist is to now take it outside of just the silo of what are your physical telecom and IT costs, and then look at the rest of the organization and say, all right, well, we're spending $10,000 a month on, on our lease. We're spending, you know, our folks are driving on average 10 to 20 hours uh, a week or something, and then look at uh, other efficiencies and heating and cooling and things like that and say, well, all right, if we implement a set of technologies that allow us to have a more flexible, that at least enable us to have a more flexible type of environment, we can potentially lower these costs. And one of the chat items I saw is, uh, as far as funders, you know, those are the types of proactive, you know, because you can only, you know, if you're trying to get, you know, blood from a stone, well, here's one way that maybe you can you can wring a bit more of it out, and and those kinds of activities are uh, uh, are look very positive to funders as well, and uh, could potentially lower the overhead and and make the organization more more nimble going forward. Right. One of the other um, cost savings that we haven't talked about yet um, is that it actually can reduce some staff time. So we had a uh, um, a full-time receptionist because the only way to reach somebody in the building was through the extension. And so when we implemented the new system, we asked for direct dial line. So now b people can can either call the main number and and talk to the receptionist or go through the phone system and dial the extension. Or if they know their person's number, they can just dial them directly. So um, we've taken the uh, the full-time receptionist to she now is part-time receptionist and part-time volunteer coordinator. So we've actually been able to free up some I mean a, a person's staff time, and that's a huge savings. I mean that that alone probably pays for the phone system. That's incredible. Uh, and uh, there was yeah. a there was a follow-up question to that about uh, just clarifying. So when they have that direct dial their extension can follow them, right? They, if they take their phone home and plug it in from their home office, yeah. it's, it's the same extension. Or if they set up follow me, it can follow them on their uh, whichever phone they designate. Is that true? That's exactly right. Excellent. We've had, um, we've had a few qu security questions come in, both with uh, VoIP and VPN. Uh, <clears throat> so what are some of the security concerns uh, and what can nonprofits do to address those? Um, in terms of VoIP, I don't know. I, I <laughs> the, the, the only thing I can think of is that the phones themselves are little computers, basically. They're much more complicated than the other phones were. Um, Matt could answer whether or not there's any chance of the phones themselves being um, infiltrated. I, I don't think so. It's kind of like your cell phone, right? It's like you know, it's much more complicated than a regular phone, but you're not really concerned about somebody infiltrating it. Um, and that, and that, yeah. that's true. Uh, it, it's difficult to, to hack into a device uh, at that far down. The, the thing that people, one of the common issues we have with some of our customers is that if they have a PBX, that the PBX on site, uh, you know, the phone switching device on site, that people, and it's kind of amazing, I don't know if it's happened to anybody 
here on the call. If it has, uh, you know, go ahead and raise your hand slightly because it's a terrible thing when it happens. It, it, uh, uh, they can come in through the voicemail and then all of a sudden you have a thousand people dialing international calls outside your PBX and you just got a $15,000 phone bill. I mean, those kinds of things go away because you're not taking the risk or responsibility for that piece of equipment anymore. And the and the piece and the equipment that's switching your calls and handling that now is in in the you know uh, distributed uh, data centers, wire centers uh, of the main providers, and they have the security at that level. Um, you know, these are huge computing systems and servers that handle millions of calls. People aren't hacking into those, and I've never heard of that actually happening uh, in in the industry. So. They're very advanced computers, much more difficult to hack into, and it's not your, you know, it's not the organization's responsibility at that level either. So uh, the level of security from things like that is is definitely higher, uh, and it's putting the burden on the provider as opposed to you having to have the the burden of of proof and of of refund for when that happens. Uh, okay, and so as far as VPN, um, it is actually a security problem. Um, I deal with that by really limiting the number of people that have it and making sure that they only connect to it using their own computers um, and really you know, using, using industry standard tools. Um, and I, I would say that, um, it, that, that down the road in the next few years, like people most of the time are still connecting over like standard VPN where you get full access to the network. Um, but most of the time that's not actually necessary. So I think that people are going to be moving to other types of, of VPNs. Such Thank you. Uh, and, and final question, we, we have just one moment here. Uh, but people were asking about uh, if, if you guys have seen a loss in productivity when people are working from home. And, uh, and is there any expectation uh, to help pay for employees' costs? to set up their home office? Uh, we actually um, usually see a pro we have people that work from home one day a week just so they can get work done. Um, because you are, you know, there's some things that you actually can do much better at home that you can do in the office in terms of really focusing on a writing assignment or um, getting some of that, that kind of work done. Um, whereas in the office, you know, people are coming around and you know, asking you questions and get, distracting you. So for certain types of work, you actually see productivity enhancement. Um. I, and I think that that's, uh, you know, I think that the, the it seems as though the, uh, the metric I've heard is it takes, it takes about 15 minutes to, and I forgot what it's called, get into the zone of where you're, you're really, you know, you're deep in concentration and you're getting work done, you know, and somebody disturbing that or what have you, it becomes, uh, it becomes difficult. Um, to, to keep that level up, uh, and there's certain work that is definitely more beneficial in the group environment versus uh, remotely or you know home, whatever it may be. Um, so, but the savings in in commute time, uh, the studies we've seen of companies that have done this, Best Buy did this with all their corporate. They, they have sort of a laboratory of doing this because they told all their employees to go home and work from home in uh, Minneapolis, well about 30% don't, don't participate, but most of them do. Their productivity went up, their healthcare costs went down, their innovation levels went up, their retention uh, went through the roof, their employees were happier, working harder, spending more time. I actually heard it on the, uh, the, the, the downside of this is people say that they end up working too much and that they have to kind of stave that off because now they're enabled to sort of work anywhere, anytime. And you have to be careful, you know, not to be not to be checking in and out uh, at will. So that's uh, one of the downsides that's in our report with uh, BGI from some of the interviews we did. And, and, and Matt, have you ever heard of, of companies being at, like paying for the cost of home offices? Um, I don't know. I know for for you know personally for our folks that uh that we uh support in our company we have uh, a number of folks that work mostly remote um uh, and you know we outfit them with with phones and computers and and whatever their link is at home and that's really the extent of it um in terms of 
other elements. I, I, I don't, I don't, there hasn't been a lot of data that I've seen on that. Um, you know, this is still kind of new frontier stuff, and it's, uh, you know, look out 50 years. The bottom line with this, you look out 50 years, and this is how the world's going to be, uh, you know, we're not going to all be sitting in cars driving in every day. Technology is going to be to a level where a lot of uh, the new generations coming up, you know, are, are used to different dynamics and things. Uh, we're going to be there some at some point. We're going to fly less because we'll have video conferencing on demand. We'll have meetings that can be uh, pulled together. You know, it's just a matter of do we want to get there sooner rather than later and realize the cost benefits and the carbon benefits. And uh, so some of these details are, these details are important, um, but there's not a lot of data out there yet. That's great. I think we're just about out of time here, so we're going to be wrapping up. And we have collected all of the questions that people have submitted. Hopefully we were able to answer a lot of them. But if not, please um, post your follow-up questions in our Emerging, Emerging Technologies Forum, in our Community Forums at the URL on the screen. Um, this will also be sent out along with the slides, the, the archived recording of this session, and other resources in an email this afternoon. So please look for that in your inbox. There are lots of resources available through TechSoup on these exact topics. So if you're looking to set up VoIP or trying to figure out what unified communications can work for you, or a blog, um, or um, you know, find a new phone system. There's lots of articles. There's lots of blog posts. You can find VPN systems and software in TechSoup Stock. You can join our community forums to continue that discussion. And you can participate in other events like this one. We have a webinar coming up next week on Microsoft's donation program. So please feel free to register and join us for that. I'd like to thank our speakers for their participation. And um, thanks Anna. Thanks Jim Lynch, Christopher Postoloff, and Kiana Griffiths from TechSoup who have been helping to monitor the chat throughout this event. And I'd like to thank our webinar sponsor, ReadyTalk. It's made possible by ReadyTalk, which has donated the use of their system to help TechSoup expand awareness of technology through the nonprofit sector. ReadyTalk, ReadyTalk helps nonprofits and libraries in the U.S. and Canada reach geographically dispersed areas and increase collaboration through their audio conferencing and web conferencing services which you've all just experienced. So thank you everybody for joining us today. And like I said, you'll be receiving this follow-up information in an email shortly. But the conversation can continue in our online forum, so please join us there. Thank you much and have a great day. Thank you.